um, this entire weekend's material, curriculum, experiences, it's all supposed to build on itself. And tonight is the foundation of this weekend. Tonight is also the material and the time that you'll hear me talk the most. That being said, it is at best as possible, really want it to be an interactive experience. Uh, please raise your hand, ask your questions. And if you're online and virtually, please uh, type your questions and we will stop and, and answer them as best as possible. Uh, because what's uh, most important as we uh, talked about is, uh, you know, feeling safe enough to ask your questions and, and get your answers here because there's a tremendous amount of misinformation. In fact, one of the most important uh, elements is when I first started in my career nearly 17 years ago, I did a, a dissertation on a infamous or famous healthcare article. And what that healthcare article said is in the healthcare field, once a particular treatment or medicine goes through all the clinical trials and all the evidence-based studies and all the publishing material and is widely considered and accepted as the way to treat a certain condition, that it takes 17 years for 51% of providers to start to implement that treatment, 17 years. And if you were to ask me, that's just the general healthcare community. And if you were to ask me, the behavioral healthcare community is even further behind that. And I think most of the curriculum that I see in traditional treatment centers and resources is often 20 to 30 years behind. You know, some of you guys may have experienced family workshops and family resources, which let me make clear that if there's any organization that provides family support and family resources, that is a huge asset. And the reality is when I come in and look at it, oftentimes their curriculum is from textbooks from the 1980s. And so if you think about it, even think about what sort of technology you were using 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And would you remotely want that to be what you guys are being treated with? And so some of the material that we're gonna go over even tonight is as recent as even from a year and a half ago, you know, because it's really important to understand and to provide families with the best resources as possible. In fact, I spend most of my time, uh, my free spare time educating professionals. And like I said, I uh, had a medical lunch and learn yesterday, a room full of physicians and psychiatrists. And when it comes to understanding this disease and this healthcare, healthcare, when it comes to understanding mental health and how it impacts healthcare, even they don't understand. And that misinformation compounds your experience and compounds your frustration. And so tonight, that's why we're really going through uh, the appreciation of this material that is said accurate knowledge makes it power. So as we go through this uh, information, he said, ask your questions. There's no silly or, or stupid question. The title of uh, tonight's material is much more than just the disease and understanding the disease model. I call this new realities for the 21st century because we are in a, a different day and age than 20 and 30 years ago when we're talking about how much mental health impacts you know, individuals and families and what sort of substances are out there. It is a different day and age. And we know so much more when it comes to treating this disease. The information and the education that uh, the professional community has gotten in the past 10 years has really provided us with a tremendous amount of resources to help you guys. And it's really important that you guys understand those resources that you guys have at your disposal. And before we even get there, you know, one of the things that you guys hopefully experience in just the introduction is that idea that there's people in this room to help you not feel alone. And I can tell you, I feel the same way. You know, I got into this field because I grew up, you know, uh, I grew up in a, a very loving household. Actually, I was one of those kids that you that you love to hate. It was almost in a Freddie Prince Jr. movie, the homecoming king, the prom king. I didn't drink, didn't do drugs, didn't do any of that. And still I woke up in Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, chained to the bed for 17 days, in and out of treatment centers, in and out of mental health wards, in and out of substances. Yet I grew up the first 18 years of my life without near a problem. And so when I finally got into this uh, process and got into this healing process, I really wanted to understand what happened to me, what happened to my family, 
And so this, the hopelessness that you guys feel and the frustration you guys feel uh, when it comes to understanding and treating this disease, I've been there. You know, I've been there and I've gone to that healthcare community and asked for help, you know, only uh, to be given misinformation and had the experiences. And so I know that when, we, when my family first got into this process, that's what the entire healing process began. And so for everybody here, if I were to ask you, what's your goal of being here? Like, what is your goal? You come in here tonight, what do you hope to gain? Who can tell me, what's your goal for being here? Help my son. Help my son. Help your, help your son. Absolutely. Tools. Tools. To gain tools. What else? Uh, my goal is to work towards healing the family. Work towards healing the family. To gain tools, work toward healing the family help your son. I think if we were all mm -hmm. honest, it is some sort of process of action that we're here, that we come in here in some state of unhealthiness of some, and we hope to get healthier. Because if at its highest level, if you really want to understand what the goal is of you guys being here, the goal is change. To gain tools, to gain experience, to go from some state of unhealthiness, dysfunction, sick, and go to another state where we're healing. You know, and if you look at it at its highest level, the goal is change. I want to change the way that things are right now. No, like I said, nobody comes in here hot damn on a winning streak. Everything's going well and fine. And so the goal is change. And that's action oriented. I can't tell you how many family workshops I've been a part of where everybody will have a wonderful emotional time. You'll go, you'll, you'll cry, you'll hug. And then on Monday, nothing changes. And so our entire workshop, our entire curriculum is based in action. Application is the key to transformation. What you learn this weekend is just the beginning to take it and, and apply it to create change. Change is action oriented. And that's the goal that we have for you is for you guys to go through change, to go from some state and to gain, to become happy, healthy, and more connected as a family. And there are two experiences and goals that we hope everybody has. And these aren't just, you know, neat words that go on a lanyard. We're going to be referring to these words throughout the entire week. And even from a neuroscience biological level, empathy and perspective shift. I want you guys to keep remembering these words, empathy and perspective shift and how they're, how important they are when motivating change. I mean, if you guys think about it, you guys are in the middle of a war when you're talking about battling this disease and what it does to a family. And just when you're in the middle of that, that trauma, that intensity, and you feel like you're alone, you know, the two most powerful words you can say to somebody when they're suffering are me too, where you can feel like you're not battling through this alone. Just a, just a little bit of empathy goes a long way. That's one of the goals that we have, especially when it comes to family members and identified patients here is we hope tonight's information allows a little empathy to go both ways. You guys begin to have a little more patience, love, and tolerance for each other. Because I know that uh, most of us, if we've been in any form of uh, professional resource when it comes to this disease, you know, maybe we've often talked about the, the brain disease from the identified patient's perspective and maybe even seen some brain images of identified patients. Have you ever seen the brain images of family members? when you go through what you have. When you talk about the family disease, has anybody actually shown you what family members go through from a disease perspective? You know, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna get in tonight, actually talk about what are the actual biological disease changes that family members go through. That's often, that's never discussed. In fact, I think far too often family members are shamed. You're often called codependent and enabling, and that's just language that we try not to use anymore. Because the truth of the matter is, you guys are trauma survivors. You're having a loved one struggle with disease is traumatic. You identified patients surviving mental health and surviving substance use disorders is traumatic. And so if all too often, the traditional treatment professional language becomes very, very shaming. When the truth of the matter in here, everybody in here has resiliency and are trauma survivors. And so beginning to understand that 
it just isn't a matter of bad people being good, but just sick people on both sides of the equation that just need the proper help and support. And understanding what each of us goes through allows for that little bit of empathy to creep in. And so accurate knowledge helps with that. Correcting the misunderstanding, doing away with the stereotypes, you know, helps with that. And so our first topic tonight is understanding the problem. When they say this is a disease or a family disease, what the heck do they mean by that? Truly understanding the, the problem and dispelling just gross misconceptions. If I spend the rest of my career trying to shoot down two statements, it's you really have to want it to get better or have to hit rock bottom to get better. Categorically false in every way. And we're going to talk about why that is and what can we do about it. And so when we first want to understand, talk about the solution the rest of the weekend, because I know that's what you guys are here for, is what can we do? What's the solution? We must first understand the problem. And all too often in this field, we get tunnel vision on the chemical consumption, and we want to blame the identified patients for everything. When the truth of the matter is, there's something larger going on in our world, something larger going on in our society. What I call a nation held hostage, you know, even in 2024, there's not... Anybody that hadn't heard of the opioid epidemic dating back to the, you know, the 2010s and, and teens, you know, what you see here is just a heat image of overdoses in the country, you know, from 1999 to, you know, 2014, strangely, we haven't come out with the updated heat image. It takes about five years for these to come out. They're a little delayed due to COVID, but if I were to show you the, what the country looks like, this, that whole country would be red. And so all of us have heard about the opioid epidemic and even here in, in North Carolina. And as it gets closer, you know, it is significantly impactful. And even in our community, as we talk about what's happening in our community, you know, overdoses increased in all 100 counties. And I want to say that this is now seven years after our current United States Surgeon General said we were in the worst public health care crisis our country had ever seen when talking about mental health and substance use disorders. This is seven years after that. The overdoses increased in all 100 counties. In fact, in the 16 counties right here around Charlotte, there's enough prescription pills for every man, woman, and child to have a bottle of 83 pills. Every man, woman, and child to have a bottle of 83 pills in just the 16 counties around the Charlotte. In fact, even in North Carolina, four cities are in the top 20 in the nation. Wilmington, Hickory, Jacksonville, and Fayetteville are in the top 20 in the nation when talking about substance use disorders and overdose rates. You know, so that our communities in our state is actually one of the worst. In fact, in, in 2020, right before COVID, I turned, attended the North Carolina Healthcare Summit and heard the CEO of Atrium and Novant and Blue Cross and Blue Shield in a panel. And North Carolina has the highest rate of overdoses to the lowest rate of available resources of any state in the country. North Carolina has the highest rate of overdoses to the lowest rate of available resources of anywhere in the country. And that impacts you guys. It impacts access to resources. It impacts how help, how quickly you can access help, the effectiveness of this help. Just today, I got a, a call from a friend of mine that lives on the Outer Banks who needed help, help and treatment. And the closest appropriate treatment center is seven hours away. Seven hours away. That's what happened to me. I grew up on the Outer Banks and our fam this disease hit our family and we couldn't find the proper resources. Blessed to have all the resources in the world, but we couldn't find the appropriate professional resources. You know, that's These facts impact you guys' frustration, stress, anxiety when you guys try to seek help. You know, Charlotte is actually a hub due to our, our interstates, our highway system, our growing airport, where we are on the Eastern seaboard. The fact that we have uh, ports like Oregon and Wilmington and Oregon on the Outer Banks, I grew up there. They called it Midnight Tuna as it came in on the ships. And just the way it is in where we are, just it is profound how much it infiltrates our communities, our neighborhoods, our homes. <clears throat> in fact, even in Charlotte proper in a city full of a million people, 600,000 narcotic pills are, are so for every man, woman and child to have a bottle of 37 pills. And think about this when you demand that there's a uh, that you see a doctor. Yes. Uh, 
That's a great, we're getting, we're getting ready to get into that. What caused this profound increase? It's like, what's happening? Because that's what we're talking, there's something else going on here. You know, like the substance consumption, as we'll talk about, is just a symptom of a problem. If that's all we needed to treat this disease, prisons would work. They don't. And so treating this disease is about something different. It's about getting to that underlying current, that soul wound, that dual diagnosis. The symptom, the substance consumption, the, this is just a symptom of a larger problem. That's narcotic pills. Right? Yep. Also, we are 4 to 5% of the global population, and we consume 90% of the world's pain medicine. What do you think that says? 4 to 5% of the global population and consume 90% of the world's pain medicine. You think we're the only ones in pain? Or do you think there's something else going on that's driving this? In fact, when we think about what mental health uh, pandemic is having on, you think you're suffering out there alone, but the fact of it is, being in this field now, there's not one family walking around now that isn't directly affected by mental health or substance use disorder. In fact, one out of four of adults suffer from a mental health issue. Our country alone, when you look at the most modern and wealthy countries, one of the highest among the top, top 11 have the highest state of mental health issues. <clears throat> one out of eight in the world just generally live with a mental disorder. You know, how that is anxiety, depression, bipolar are the worst. The most frequent, you know, depression is actually the leading cause of medical disability worldwide. And so oftentimes they want to make us feel like we're the, you know, we have a monopoly on spiritual bankruptcy, like it's all fart when the reality is this is just a human being condition. Depression, a mental health issue is the leading cause of medical disability worldwide. And so if so many people are out there are suffering from it, then why are we so afraid out there to talk about it? And what else is going on here? One out of three women suffer from depression. One out of five men. You know, mental health is an indicator of a society's well-being. And how is America doing right now? You know, if we think about it, especially when we talk about co-occurring disorders, co-occurring dual diagnosis means you've got a, a substance use disorder going on and a mental health issue. That's profoundly what we see the most of, I imagine, 90 ish percent of the patients we see, I would classify as co-occurring, dual diagnosis. And in my mind, that is the most misunderstood part of our entire healthcare system, grossly misunderstood. In fact, these are conservative statistics that 37% of people with an alcohol disorder have another mental health dis issue compared to 56% of those with a drug disorder have a mental. Statistically, that's remarkable. That's a big difference. Why do you think there's such a big difference? Those with an alcohol disorder have a mental health issue compared to those with a, a drug disorder, 56% also have a mental health issue. So much more alcohol, well, 37%, there's 20% more that have a drug addiction have uh, a mental health issue. Meaning those with, those with uh, substance issues have a much higher, That it's what? The effect of, of the drugs. The effect of the drugs. drugs. Chemistry. Sadly, I have met many alcoholics, uh, people who struggle with alcohol for 30 to 40 years. Haven't met many meth addicts of 30 to 40 years. Haven't met many heroin addicts. And now the introduction of fentanyl, which is different. Those chemicals do have profoundly more impact on the brain. Do have more, more profoundly more common? Does Oh, ab absolutely. That's a included in the substances. Uh, those statistics talk about the drug of choice when <clears throat> inducing mental disorder. What is the reverse statistic? Mental disorder inducing substance. So for those uh, online is basically asking what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know, when it comes to dual diagnosis. That's something we will talk about the entire time. It's a very appropriate question, but make no mistake if it's a very common and appropriate question to figure out. And the most important thing to understand is regardless if you have a primary mental illness or regardless if you have a substance use disorder, you have to treat the substance use disorder first. 
you can't get an idea of what's happening organically with a mental health issue until you stop the chemical consumption. Just because you treat the substance use disorder first doesn't make that the primary, but you do have to treat it first. How could you possibly get an idea of, of how a brain operates organically if you still have this third party met, uh, influencer coming in? And so it's, it's a great question. We'll talk about that throughout the entire of, of how do you treat and manage dual diagnosis. And so 90% of people with co-occurring disorders did not receive services for both. That means when they go in, inside treatment, they don't receive services for both. In fact, when I moved back to Charlotte, in 2016, Charlotte being the most progressive city of North Carolina, there wasn't one dual diagnosis resource. 2016, wasn't one dual diagnosis resource. Like I said, and when it comes to understanding this, the healthcare community does not understand. And if there's a psychiatrist out there, God bless you, psychiatrist as a whole are the worst. There's wonderful individual psychiatrists that understand it, but psychiatrists as a whole are the worst. They're the only medical specialists that don't measure or look at the organ they treat. And when you get them in a room, they'll admit it. That when it comes to understanding when substances affect the mental health issue, they weren't trained. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of 400 medical school graduates and said, how many of you guys have had one week's worth of training on mental health and substance use? And nobody raises their hand. Let me remind you, this is seven years after the United States Surgeon General said this was the worst disease our country had ever seen, and our medical community is not getting educated about it. In fact, they have more education of diseases in sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean than they did on substances. I'll get down to three days, and they'll raise their hand, and that includes caffeine and cigarettes. They just don't understand. And so that's, I know you guys have experienced that. It's just that profoundly misinformation when it comes to treating this disease. <clears throat> and so understanding how we got here, that was the question is what, what's happening? How did we get to the point that in 2017, 70,000 Americans died of the overdose? That's more Americans than died in the Vietnam War, by the way. And so, and oftentimes we'll get stuck on the opioid epidemic. 88,000 people died of alcohol disorder. And that was a year that we couldn't open the newspaper or turn on the news without hearing about the opioid epidemic. That was the politician's platform. And we tried to do something about it. <clears throat> in 2018, it actually went down a little bit. However, in 2017, there was also an unfortunate uh, term coined called death of despair. It's actually a, uh, a couple out of uh, Princeton did research and they coined death of despair are classified as Alcohol-related liver deaths, overdoses, and suicides went up in every state in the country. Went up in every state in the country. Along with these overdoses, along with the alcohol-related deaths. In fact, if you were to sum up all of 2017, of all the substance-related deaths and throwing cigarettes, the entire state of Vermont died in 2017. The entire state of Vermont passed away due to substance in 2017. And we did something about it, but just like any good uh, American, very short-term focused, we, pat, we patted ourselves on the back. Let me make clear that if any life saved is a life earned. And so it's wonderful that that went down, but it bounced right back up. 2019, 72,000 happened. In fact, I did an interview on the, the TV when these statistics came out and I said, it's only going to get worse. And the uh, reporter's like, there's no way. I said, it's only going to get worse. You know, these are diseases of isolation, mental health and, and substance use disorders. Our biology, we need to be safe, secure, and connected. That's not psychology, that's biology. So what do you think happened when COVID hit? When words like quarantine and distancing and isolation were forced upon us, understandably, what do you think happened? In fact, I can tell you in, in February 2020 to July 2020 here in Charlotte, involuntary psychiatric holds went up 250%, 250% the first seven months of COVID. Alcohol sales went up 867%. And so what's happening there? You know, also, I can also tell you that, you know, two years into COVID, the most common question I got was from a chamber of commerce asking me to come talk. People never having a mental health issue, never having a substance use disorder were profoundly impacted by anxiety, depression, and so all of us began experiencing that. 
the anxiety, the depression, because we're, we need that safe, secure connection. It's, it's what we need as human beings. And we lived in an inhumane environment. And that created undercurrents of anxiety, depression that we all experience. In fact, in 2023, over 100,000 people died of overdoses, 105,000. And it's only going to get worse. And so what else is, is going on here? Because I know we can look at and get tunnel vision on the identified patient, but make no mistake, the American adult society is also the most obese, addicted, medicated, in-debt adult society ever. The American adult society is the most obese, addicted, medicated, in-debt adult society ever. And think about what those behaviors are at the root. What are those behaviors? Most obese, addicted, medicated, in-debt adult society ever. Instant gratification. Instant gratification, right? They're all medicators. Oh, let me let me use something external to feel something internal. And so identify patients. I know sometimes the world wants to point toward us, but make no mistake, this is a human being condition. Four to five percent of the world population consuming 90% of the world's pain medicine. You know what's going on here? Also, I can also tell you, we know in healthcare, happy people live longer, scientifically. Happy people live longer. And for a century in American society, our life expectancy has gone up. And for the first time in a century, what do you think happened in 2017? Went down. So there's something else happening here. In fact, suicides, five to eight uh, percent increase just in 2022 alone. That's remarkable. That's substantial. So what's the real issue? If we're gonna talk about the solution, the rest of the, we have to first identify the problem. It's not just about stopping the chemical consumption. Like I said, that's the easiest part of our job. And so what's really going on here? You know, if we think about it, let's take even a hard look. The stress and trauma that our world goes through right now. How many of you guys grew up and went to active shooter training, uh, active shooter training uh, drills in high school? Do you have to worry about any adults in here have to go through that? I had to worry about standing on my tippy toes to get to the water fountain or, you know, kissing Stacy under the curly slide. I didn't have to worry about active shooter training drills. But what about the stress and trauma just constantly at their fingertips? Uh, just constantly at their fingertips. I mean, I have you know, seven year olds coming to worry about what's happening in the Ukraine. I didn't have to worry about that. And th this slide was actually created before COVID. I mean, we live in a world where stress and uh, exhaustion is a status symbol. You know, gone are the elements of community. Gone are front porches. Gone are connection points in neighborhoods. And no matter what city you live in, whether you grow up on the Roanoke Island, which is a five mile, five by 12 mile island that I grew up on, or LA or New York, that I spent time in, you can still find a community. But gone are those days. We live in a scarcity culture. Don't have enough, don't have enough. Exhaustion is a status symbol. And I'm the same way. I want to get down, drive down my neighborhood, pull in my driveway, pull in the garage, shut the door behind me because hell if I want to say hey to the neighbor walking their dog. I just don't have time for this shit. I'm too tired. We all know what that's like. We live in a world where exhaustion is a status symbol. Too busy, too busy, constant. <clears throat> and technology. Don't get me, get me started. I could spend the next five days on this. We are the most connected, disconnected society ever, ever. And this doesn't say uh, technology alone isn't bad. There are wonderful advancements with technology. And the out of balance that we've gotten is out of control. And just how we connect with one another. How many of you guys, this was what family time looks like? How many of you guys text people in the same house? The same room? across the dinner table? How many of you couples lay on your couch looking at a big screen while you also look at a small screen? Or when you have a really difficult conversation to have? <laughs> that that's the way you have the difficult conversation. And that I know that laughter, we know what that is. It's like when we have something really difficult to say, really intimate, we will type a novella over text. And we'll say because it's convenient, but we're not being honest. 
It's because we don't want to be vulnerable as well to go have that face to face conversation. In fact, our staff has a rule that, uh, you know, first text, uh, email and text are rational forms of communication never meant for emotional subjects. It's amazing as a marriage and family therapist, how many marital coupleship problems would go away if they just kept their phones out of the master bedroom past 8 p.m. If you needed to use the phone, absolutely just go outside. Just don't bring it in the bedroom past 8 p.m. It's amazing how much goes away. You know, and if you think about that text message, like that's, that's how we have difficult conversations as a couples, as parents. We've lost the ability to have crucial conversations from emotionally connected places. We don't like being uncomfortable. That's why we consume 90% of the world's pain medicine. That's why we're the most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt society ever. It's because we have lost the ability to have those crucial, even in our own house. We don't know how to talk to each other anymore. Don't know how to express ourselves. Because what happens? That's the most vulnerable point that we'll get. And so we'll send a text message. How is that text message interpreted by the sender or the receiver? I mean, even to this day, if somebody asks me a yes or no question, if I don't put 17 emojis and exclamation behind it, they say, why are you being so short with me? My staff has a rule that if somebody sends you a novella over text or email, you have permission to delete it without reading it. Pick up the phone, call and go answer them. The rational forms of communication never meant for emotional subjects the most disconnected as I ever. We live in this Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat world where we're wonderful putting filters on things, even though I'm depressed. Just think about that. Think about it. You know, those of you that may not know what addiction sounds like, you know, they say if the last thing you think about is a drink before you go to bed or the first thing you wake up is a drink, you may be an alcoholic. What about the last thing you look at is your phone and the first thing you look at is your phone and from room to room you carry your phone? You may be addicted. And so just think about that dopamine driven culture that we have on that when it comes to that device and how much it disconnects us. And understanding that that's not a way to communicate. It's called text message, not text conversation. And just the impact that this have. You know, when social media came out on cell phones that adolescent female suicides and ER visits have increased 151% since social media came out on cell phones. It's called the gamification of technology. The buzz, the ding, the like, we love it. We can't, we don't want to read the email, but we'll scroll, we'll scroll, we'll scroll, we'll scroll. The like, the trauma of being unfriended, just how much that impacts us. There are, there are patients that will detox more when I take away their phone when they're coming off of drugs and alcohol. Where have we gotten? Just think about how you connect as a family. We wonder why we raise a generation that doesn't have, you know, emotional, we, we blame Generation Z. Who's the generation that's raising them? The most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt adult society ever. But they're so exhausted, they're not even home. And even when they're home, their way of communicating is over text message. And we wonder why we're raising a generation that's emotionally immature and can't cope. And so if we wanna to begin to talk about the solution and to first understand the problem, I can't stand when we point toward Generation Z. It's like, well, who's the generation that's raising them? Where do you think they get it from? <clears throat> and also the understanding of the lack of parenting that goes on in this world. And this isn't a knock on divorce because there's some divorces that are healthy, but the absolute inability to co-parent. The absolute inability to co-parent. You know, the understanding that when it comes to coupleship and marriage and, and partnership, you know, there's a romantic part of it and there's a spousal there's a husband and wife romantic part and then there's a parental part they both need to be cultivated but if that romantic spousal part goes away you will always be mother and father to that child and no matter what resentments you have as a romantic part those children's lives are better with a healthy mom and healthy dad and so the absolute inability to co-parent in fact, one of the most increasing demographics is called the gray divorce. It was on the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago. The most increased divorce demographic is over 50. You know, you know why that is? Is because what happens when, when parents have kids and they get hyper-focused on mom and dad mode and they neglect the spouse mode, hyper-focused on mom and dad mode, 
for 18, 20 years, however many kids they have. And the moment that their empty nest syndrome, instead of leaning in toward each other, they're staring across the room from a stranger. Instead of leaning in and having the uncomfortable conversation, they choose the easy way out. Instant gratification. It's called the gray divorce, the most increasing demographic. It's because it's sort of leaning into it and leaning into the discomfort and having those crucial conversations. They've been texting each other and we don't know how to have those conversations. And so we choose the easy way and divorce. And so the absolute inability to co-parent, the understanding that in a healthy family, the parents are there to service the kids. In an unhealthy family, the kids are there to service the parents. And that's a reality that's happening. And there's a part of this that's absolutely out of your control and we for, is an unbelievably broken healthcare system when it comes to treating this disease. Unbelievably broken. You guys don't know that our field, our behavioral health field, you don't have to have a license or experience to open up a treatment center. There's no governance and no re regulation. There's no governing body of our field. You guys don't know that. You can open up a sober living tomorrow. You can be an interventionist tomorrow. You can get a DHHS license tomorrow. You can't do that with medical with a medical office. You have to get approved by the North Carolina Medical Board, not in our field. You guys don't know that. You'll Google WebMD because the healthcare field throws it at your feet. It says you Google WebMD, you figure it out. You don't know that therapists can get their license without ever having to take a substance abuse course. You go to a therapist, you go to their general practitioner, and I'll hear that, well, Ward, you're not a doctor. I said, I know, but we're the ones they call in to educate them. No, but you don't know this field. There's 4,000 treatment centers and probably only two or three dozen that I would remotely send a family member to. And you guys don't know that. There's no universal standard that says you have to use evidence-based care. None. And that compounds your frustration, compounds your experience. How many of you guys have been through the 30-day re rehab shuffle and probably spent several hundred thousand dollars? Happens all the time. I see you guys nodding your head. You know, that's part that that compounds to the frustration. We we talk about it as professionals. There's a part of this industry that has lost family members' trust, and we have to earn it back. And that's a reality. And that's something. And you also talk about North Carolina being the highest rate of overdoses, the lowest rate of available available resources. That adds to your frustration and stress. And Exactly why when you say I want some I want X Y and Z resource close by and I'm like I'm sorry, they're not it's not around. You know the, part of this is, you know the art of what's possible, like and, you know I would say about, like I said and and being conservative about even in our own specialty I would say about, ninety five ninety eight percent of professionals don't know what they're doing or using approaches that are twenty and thirty years old, and they're not intentionally trying to do it. And it's still the reality of what happens. And this, ultimately, this means that the, the status quo, this part of healthcare, the, the statistical prognosis for this part of healthcare has not increased in 40 years. What other part of healthcare, with all of our advancements in technology, all of our ability to understand this disease, the prognosis for this disease has not increased in 40 years. It's the same as what it was in 1980. The outcomes, the outcomes have not increased. And yet our understanding and ability of this trees have increased magnificently, unbelievably. We actually have a significant understanding of how to treat this disease. And if you think about it, general healthcare isn't, uh, is started in the Renaissance. That was when general healthcare started. So it's centuries old. Behavioral health really started in the 1980s in a very infantile field. It really started, money really started to pour into it when Betty Ford came out. That's when really money started to really pour into research. And so the field is 40 to 50 years old compared to healthcare that is centuries old. And so you can begin to understand why it's so misunderstood. And so there's so much we've learned even in the past seven to 10 years that just isn't applied. And so... Uh, and also like to compound this, the healthcare system, I mean, you've got, they'll throw it at you guys' feet. What other disease in the world would we say, you Google WebMD, you find your treatment center and just go? No other disease would we do that, but they throw it at you guys' feet. And that's why status quo is unacceptable. It, 
you know, I think it's less than 10% of people get treatment. That's the prognosis. And so that's what adds to you guys' frustration. And the reality is this disease, as we talked about, has changed. This is what comes into our office all the time now. These are research chemicals. Colonazepam, blubaprofamax. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Like that's what comes, gone are the days of the hippie lettuce of 10 and 20% purity. You know, gone are the days as unhealthy as it was that I would drink Strawberry Boone's Farm before high school and get drunk and go into, gone are those days. That's what's coming into our, I know that, that, that laughter, that's knowing laughter. I know your lies for a living. As unhealthy as it was, this is what's coming into our offices. This is what adolescents bring in there. This is what, this can be ordered off the internet over a Snapchat or social media, FedEx to your house legally in a nondescript FedEx in 24 hours. Comes into our office every week. Gone are the days of the hippie lettuce of 10 and 20% purity, 98, 99% purity. And I love the legal legal argument that has nothing to do with how dangerous and addictive it is. Percocets are legal. Budweiser are legal. It's still addictive. Has nothing to do with how addictive or dangerous it is. Just a different chemical. In fact, a uh, very profound article just came out in the Wall Street Journal. The most rising de demographic is young adult psychosis. Because the potency of marijuana, gone are those days of the hippie lettuce. I, I'm speaking to middle schools now, where I was used to speak to high schools and colleges, and I go into middle schools now. Going to one next week into Raleigh. Now, because that's where fentanyl is now, and it's fentanyl poisoning now. It's not fentanyl overdose. The children that are dying and the people that are dying don't have mental health histories or substance abuse histories. In fact, I talked to a parent a few months ago whose 17 year old experimented with one beer at a party and died because somebody put a counterfeit Xanax in the beer and it was laced with fentanyl. Child experimented with one beer and it died. One drop of that in a vape handed to the wrong person. You can understand there's no safe experimentation anymore. Yes, that's unfair and that's scary and that's our reality. And so being present and connected in your children's lives, how important that is. And that may mean that you have to change this exhausted lifestyle where you're texting everybody, being present and engaged and understanding what's going on. It's like all the time that schools want to call, it, call me in and say, can you help us identify when people are struggling with substances and mental health? So yes, we can do that and that'll be helpful, but that's just a short-term problem solving. The solution is in the system. The solution is at home. And we work hand in hand with uh, CMPD and, and uh, local communities. Where do you think here in the Charlotte region that they're called the most? Police and ambulance. South Charlotte, Valentine, the most affluent and wealthiest areas where they're called the most. And so there's an equal opportunity destroyer. And so this is what comes in to all the time. It's what comes in and understanding that this is this is profound. This is what impacts our, you know, kids and what they can get over Snapchat and social media. And so the rest of this tonight and the rest of uh, tonight, we're really going to take an understanding of how does all of this impact the brain, if you think about it. Fundamental understanding of what does all this mean, all this stress, all this anxiety, this new environment that we're living in, the behaviors that we're experiencing. How does this impact us, all of us? is an understanding in the brain and how the brain develops. What we know is the brain in the healthiest of circumstances, in the healthiest of environments, the brain is still developing and in the cooker till the mid to late 20s. It's still developing, still maturing until the mid to late 20s. And prior to that, the brain goes through stages of development, zero to seven, seven to 13, 13 to 18. And the brain is very plastic. It's very influenceable. It's very permeable in those states. Things cross the blood brain barrier at greater rates. And so, don't you think that research chemical profoundly impacts the brain? You think 98% purity profoundly impacts the brain? You wonder why mental health and substances are getting earlier and earlier? It's because this is what's impacting our kids. Don't you think that Im impacts a, a brain that is impacted by substances at a far greater rate? You know, we understand that that's. And how the brain develops, it develops from the inside out, the, the limbic system to the frontal cortex. And we know that when we look back at, at people, when adults come into mental health and are diagnosed with mental health issues, we're able to take their history 
were able to understand 20% of mental health cases start to display symptoms at 13, 14. 50% start to show in adolescence. Adolescence. And then by the age of 24, mid 20s, 75% of mental health cases are presented. That's because that's what the brain is fully forming. It's shaping organically. We're able to look back and identify. And the problem is those are also the years of experimentation. Those are also the years where they're running across vapes, substances, and the impact that that has on their brain. Make no mistake, we know that the earlier their intersection of substances to the brain, the higher likelihood, the overwhelming higher, 10 to 15 times higher likelihood they're gonna have a substance use or a mental health issue, the earlier they have an introduction of substances. It's one of the main problems when parents tell me, well, I'll, I'll allow them to drink under 21 just in my roof. I say, not only are you telling them they can break the law as long as it's okay with you, and we wonder why we're raising an entitled group, but two, the most important thing is the earlier the introduction of substances, the higher likelihood for mental health and substance abuse issues. It's a fact. Because things cross the blood-brain barrier at greater rates, much more profoundly. And so that's what, really, when you think about also experiences, traumatic experiences, what you grew up in, think about how you grew up, what you were around. That impacts your brain, the environment you grew up in. I call it the firecracker puppy analogy. What I mean by that is there can be a litter of puppies with the same DNA. One gets a, adopted and he eats whenever he wants, gets bones from a treatment center and sits on the couches. His name is Gibbs and he grows up in a very loving family, like the therapy dog down at TBI. Or another one gets adopted to a family that throws firecrackers by it all the time. How do you think they're gonna grow up? Differently, right? Same DNA, same parents, different environment. So how did you grow up? What environment did you grow up with? Was it traumatic? Was there a lot of screaming and yelling? How were you raised? How did you relate? How did you learn how to communicate? There is so much that we learn that in our ability to communicate between the ages of zero to seven as our brain develops. And an understanding of that and how we repeat those patterns and how we communicate now. Think about what sort of traumas did you guys go through? Trauma is what I call like a lightning bolt that hits a house without a transformer. You know, your brain, if you happened when you were under 25, said your brain wasn't prepared to deal with the intense emotions. And that's what happens. You know, when people experience significant trauma and are sexually assaulted or raped and, and they're, they experience it three, four, five times, you think they're the most unluckiest people in the world? Or you think something happens in their brain, it's called trauma reenactment. Something that rewires their brain. And there's significant, significant brain impact there. And so it's not just about substance. What type of environment did you grow up in? Same with ADHD. ADHD diagnosis has increased 75% in the past 10 years. That's a frontal lobe disorder. You think 75% of frontal lobes just stop working? Or you think it's a misdiagnosis? It's like the first generation that we put screens in front of them since birth. And so there's so much we learn in how to connect and how to relate to our families, how to communicate emotions in zero to seven, seven to 13. In fact, there's a hyperbolic example I give. I, I did a study on what was called a feral child. It was a child that was born in Europe to two alcoholic parents. And at eight months old, they put it in the dog kennel with about a dozen other dogs. And at that time, Europe's version of Child Protective Services came in and rescued it at about seven years old. And she was crawling around, barking, eating out of the dog. She thought she was a dog. And now she's in her mid-20s and she lives in an asylum and she's up on two feet, but she can't formulate sentences. She can't, she can communicate somewhat, but there's a part of her ability to communicate that if you don't develop between zero and seven, you don't develop. You know, how you relate, how you connect, how you express emotions. Actually, we learned a tremendous amount in zero to seven. And so think about how you grew up. How was emotion expressed? How was love expressed? You know, what, how did you grow up? You know, my family, I grew up in a wonderful uh, family with a loving mother and father. They, they expressed their love. They hugged us. They kissed us and all that in an appropriate level. And as, as a husband and wife, I never saw them fight. I never saw them argue. But I never saw them hold hands either. The wonderful roommates. I remember going over to my friend's house at 17 and seeing his mom and dad lie on the couch watching a movie together. And I said, that's weird. 
And so I just, I never saw them hold hands. And, and so what do you think their three sons had trouble with? Two of us ended up divorced. And so it's not our fault. And it's our responsibility to learn and do something about it. And so beginning to understand how you relate, how you communicate, especially with your current family members and gaining that awareness. That's why understanding family of origin and family involvement is so important, especially when how we develop in our brain. And so with that understanding of the brain impact and how the brain develops, you know, how did that guy you know, end up going from not doing any substances to being strapped down to the psych ward? The identified patient. You know, we know that substance use disorders is a matter of predisposition and exposure. We know that genetics is involved. You know, it's a huge part of it. We know that it happens on a spectrum. This disease happens on a spectrum. In fact, when I go to talk at, at conferences, they tell faculty, don't use the word addiction when you come in here. It's not even in the DSM. It's called substance use disorders. That word addiction is not in the DSM, our diagnostic manual. It's called substance use disorders. It happens on a spectrum. In fact, when you think about the word addiction, your mind goes straight to the junkie under the bridge and the drunk in the alley. The image of the person on their worst day. But the reality is 76% of people that struggle with a substance use disorder or mental health issue have a fully functioning job. 76% of people with a mental health issue or substance use disorder have a fully functioning job. Gone are the days of the drunk in the alley or the junkie under the bridge. That's less than 10% of what we see. It happens on a spectrum, substance use disorders, mental health disorders, it happens on a spectrum. That's why when you're looking for help and you call Cindy Lou, who's a neighbor, and they say, well, they went to this treatment center, go there. You can't necessarily go there. I don't care if the same age, same gender. There's no telling what sort of dynamics your disease is and what you're facing with. This disease, people are individualized. It happens on a different spectrum. Just because you uh, suffer from substance use disorders doesn't mean you've automatically got the scarlet letter A stamped on your forehead. Too many professionals get tunnel vision with the chemical consumption and want to stamp everybody addict and alcoholic. And those are words, hopefully, at, in the professional setting, you don't hear our clinicians say. We believe it and support it in the community support setting, you know, that you say that in the community support setting, but in the professional setting, we're more than our disease. It's the way it is with any disease. When you're a cancer survivor, you go to the cancer support group and you say, I'm bored, I'm a cancer survivor. You don't go in the doctor's office and become the cancer patient. And so this is a disease. And the problem with our healthcare system is even professionals will raise their hand that they think it's disease, but when it comes to applying treatment, they'll apply it like it's a choice. And they'll tell you, you really have to want it to get better or have to hit rock bottom to get better. What other disease would we treat that way? That is the only disease in the world where we make families and loved ones believe they have to wait till the highest level of severity or highest level of acuity before we do anything about it. Would we treat cancer that way? It's like, I know we caught it early, I know we caught it cancer stage one, but don't worry about taking off school. Don't worry about coming here. Go back out there, hang out, maybe lay in the sun a little bit. Come back in here when it's stage four, when it's really difficult to treat, really costly, really deadly. And maybe it's time to take off work or school. Maybe it's time to get treatment. This is just like any other disease, folks. The earlier the intervention, the following the professional recommendation, the better the results. Just like any other disease, if you Google WebMD and you decide what to do, prognosis is not going to be good. And so understanding of, of this disease, and if there's nothing else you take from this whole weekend, please take the next five minutes, is because this idea that motivation matters or want matters is categorically false. And let me challenge that, that let me clarify that, that if somebody's gonna live a lifetime of healthy stability and a lifetime of healthy recovery long-term, yes, they're gonna have to want it, they're gonna have to engage, they're gonna have to have that internal motivation, but not now and not the beginning. And what I mean by that is most mental health conditions are dysregulation in the frontal cortex. Also, all substances of abuse affect the body differently initially. You have your uppers and downers. People are familiar with uppers, cocaine, speed, meth, Adderall that are excitatory toward the brain. Downers like benzos, alcohol, marijuana, opiates, uppers and downers. Some people like to go fast. Some people like to go slow. Some of us like them both. But in the end, in the long run, all of those chemicals affect the body and the brain the same way and they shut off or severely diminish the activity in the frontal cortex. So without geeking out in neuroscience, which I can do, why is that so important to everything you guys experience this weekend and moving forward? 
is because the frontal cortex controls executive functioning, common sense, emotional regulation, spirituality, individuality, judgment, reasoning, problem solving. Everything that makes somebody unique in an individual is in their frontal cortex. That's why the most common statement I hear family members make, it's like, I just want my child back. I just want my spouse back. I just want my family member back. It's like invasion of the body snatchers, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. My family called me Wardzilla when I was under the influence. It's because the part of the brain that makes people unique and individual is not working properly. It's not working properly. That executive function, that frontal cortex, judgment, reasoning, problem solving, rational decision-making, emotional regulation, it's not working properly. Ability to organize thoughts, not working properly. And look at this brain. This is the brain of, of somebody 100 days abstinent. So what you need to see here is that top line, that top horizontal line is the normal brain activity of somebody. The middle line is somebody 100 days abstinent. That bottom line is, I mean, that bot, I mean, the middle line is 10 days abstinent. That bottom line is 100 days abstinent. So let me ask you guys, that's after they've completed 90 days of treatment, just so you know. So let me ask you guys, how many of you guys would allow anybody with that level of cognitive functioning to have any influence over your life or death treatment plan? But ask that question for 10 years and I've never had somebody say yes. So why do we allow somebody to have influence over that? Let me ask you again, how many of you guys would allow anybody to have that level, that level of cognitive functioning to have any influence over a life or death medical treat, your life or death medical treat? Never allow it. And so it comes back the brain comes back, it heals. It's called neuroplasticity, the retraining of the brain's pathways. It absolutely comes back, but it takes time. It takes two, it takes two years, this process. I don't know who told you 72 hours is a detox in 30, 60, 90 days. That was never the medical community. In fact, just so you know, that came from the military. The idea of 30 days, that didn't come from any medical science. Years ago, when a soldier had an alcohol problem, if you were gone from your pace for gone from your post for 30 days, you lost your post. So they travel to the hospital for one day, stay in the hospital for 28 days, travel back to their hospital their post for another day. 30 days of treatment. You guys use cocaine. Is that similar cost? It's a great question. That's just the easiest one I could copy and paste. <laughs> and so, but all substances are like that. And so the idea that they really have to want it to get better, like would you trust somebody with that brain? It's like, well, how would I expect that they want it if their brain's not working? In fact, I'll tell you one, we know that it affects the dopamine part of the brain, the motivation center of the brain. So why in the world would I expect somebody to be motivated consistently? The very essence of the disease dysregulates their motivation. Say, like, just to answer that question a little bit further too, cocaine and um, opiates are similar in their presentation. But if you look at something as mundane as marijuana or alcohol, it's even longer to come online. So, yep. The, you know, you would think cocaine would be durable or heroin would be durable, but really marijuana and alcohol is going to be harder to bring the brain neurologically back up to your previous level of baseline functioning. Yep. So it's no question. I mean, you can you can argue which is worse is which is better. They all have uh, characteristics that make it make them deadly chemicals. Said so it takes every bit of two years, and so this idea that you really have to want it to get better. It's just categorically false. It's backed up by SAMHSA, NIDA, all of our evidence. And I know families can get, well, they don't want it. And they don't want, and I don't expect them to. Look at that brain. Look at that brain. And the frontal cortex controls language and reasoning. For all of you families or people out there that think individual therapy is effective in this type, that's the part of the brain that calls language. Need any therapy is not that effective right now. It helps. But how good is talk therapy when the very part of your brain that processes language doesn't work? And so we don't need motivation right now. We need compliance. Sorry, one more. I can't help myself. I go right ahead. Uh, I hear people say that a lot to me too, is he just has to want it enough. Or I'll hear moms and dads, and I'm sure you do too, because I always talk about it. So they'll say, if he loved me enough or if she loved me enough, they would get me over the drug or they would choose the right thing over the wrong thing. And it's the same as if, you know, you haven't ever had a family member with dementia and they forget their loved ones. They forget their children, their spouses. It's not by choice. It's just a brain disorder. 
and it attacks the way the brain stores memories. The same exact kind of mechanism that causes that dementia is impacted when you have substances on board. So the idea that they don't love you enough to choose you or to pick the right thing, that's that's just categorically un they're incapable. So this this idea that there's emotions that we're talking about change human behavior, emotions don't change human behavior. Your actions change human behavior. And so if they don't need to want it and they don't need to be motivated, you know, what do we do? You first gotta understand that what healthcare condition, you know, do you have to want it to get better? Like, is it's not abnormal. That was me two years ago. You know, how I ended up getting in this field is I was straight laced, but yet when I was 18 and if you're from North Carolina and you grow up here, the only thing you wanna do is go to UNC to play basketball. And I was athlete of the year in North Carolina for 1999, in June of 1999. And then August 13th, to, uh, 1999, I was diagnosed with an illness and given two years to live. Breathing out of a trach in an oxygen tank within a few months, in a period of two years, I had 87 surgeries to keep me alive again. And so, do you think I wanted one of them? Do you think I'm motivated to get one of them? Chemotherapy and radiation sucks. It's inconvenient. It's costly. It has... It is unfair. It has every right to make you angry. And it's still the appropriate path to save your life. This is a healthcare crisis. There's nothing about this that people want or people get motivated for. And our job isn't customer service when it comes to this. Our job is to have difficult conversations with you. You think when that Mayo Clinic doctor told an 18 year old that he couldn't play sports again and he was gonna die in two years, and my mother to go home and start grief counseling? I think that was an uncomfortable conversation. What would you rather him do? Say, oh, you're all good sport, slap me on the rear end and say, keep doing what you're doing? It's not our job. Our job isn't to be nice. Nice kills people. Our job is to be kind. Truth without, what I tell people is, uh, you know, truth without kindness doesn't mean you're being honest. It means you're being an asshole. It still takes, uh, compassion is uncomfortable. Empathy into action is the definition of compassion. Our job is to have these uncomfortable conversations. That's what disease is, what healthcare is. But the idea that you have to want it to get better, it's not about that. It's about compliance. It's like if somebody has diabetes and they come into the ER and they get diagnosed with diabetes for the first time. Do you think they're going to get better because they want to get better if they take their insulin properly? And we need compliance right now. And for us uh, professionals who say, I hope you never say you have to want it again. Don't we believe in behavioral activation, CBT? You can act your way into healthier brain functioning. I can also tell you that even if you put substances on the shelf and you were to take depression and say, if somebody's depressed, they don't want to get up and go outside or take their medicine or go to the gym or go in the sunlight. They want to sit back and binge Netflix on the couch all day. But if you force yourself to go outside, if you force yourself to act, you, force, you can act your way into healthier brain functioning. In fact, the University of Pennsylvania, that Ivy League school, their official medical school motto is send the body, the brain will follow. And so all we need is complete. And the 12 steps have believed this since the beginning. The cliche they say is what? Come in here and fake it until you make it. Come in here and comply until your brain has time to heal. That's why there's a sober date and a surrender date. And those are two different things. And so compliance. And we know this works. And we're just about to break what we... We know this works. Many of uh, people will ask about success rates and, and I'll tell families that any treatment center that touts a success rate to you is lying to you. We haven't figured that out yet because what success look like? If somebody goes to a treatment center and whether it's outpatient, inpatient, stays sober or stable for a month, relapses for a couple months and then stays sober the rest of their life, is that a success? Or what if they you know, stay sober for a year, then, then have a reoccurrence and then stay sober? Is that a success? We haven't learned how to gauge that yet what success is, but there is one demographic we know very well, doctors, lawyers, pilots, nurses, those of us responsible for public safety. You can't uh, you know, get a DUI and then do newer, newer surgery, fly 747 the next day, they don't like that. And so they have to enter in diversion programs, it means they're monitored. And so like we work hand in hand with the North Carolina uh, Physicians Health Program, they monitor what that means that they're forced to comply with treatment and they're drug tested once a week plus 10%. And so we have this data and that 10% is for the tricky doctor or professional that you know, tests on a Monday that think they have a week to test. There's always a 10% chance you can test the next day and the next day. And the next day. We have this data for five years. 
And we know that at the end of five years, 90% are sober and stable, 90%. And if you were asking me about the general population, I would say seven to 14%. And that shouldn't be because I can create the same treatment plan for the licensure professional as I can the student or the restaurateur. It's the same exact one, 90% success rate, seven to 14%. The only controllable difference is family. And what I mean by that is most people will say, well, they have a high priced career over their head. And I said, I know that sounds like it, but the same success rate is true for stewardess or dental hygienist. 90% success rate and they make $32,000 a year. Same success rate. Only controllable difference is family. What I mean by that is Dr. Joe Jordan and the North Carolina Physicians Health Program enforces our treatment plan regardless if the patient's motivated, regardless of if they want it, regardless if they acknowledge they have a problem, regardless what the family says. You have to complete this treatment plan if you want the, your license back. Forced compliance, 90% success rate. And over here in the general population, through no fault of your own, I'm entirely dependent on educating family with enough information and enough accurate information to help them understand that they've got to hold boundaries long enough for the person's brain to heal. And that takes a year or two. And let's just be honest, that gets exhausting. After six to nine months of holding boundaries, it's very understandable. Families get treatment fatigue. It just gets exhausting holding that boundary, holding that boundary, especially when the healthcare system isn't there to help you. The insurance company cut off your benefits at 30, 60, 90 days. And here Ward is telling you, you got two years of this. It's costly. It's exhausting. You can say, I, and you can't afford it. And I said, I mean, I'm here to take, and you can't afford not to. The truth of the matter is, just gets exhausting. And there's so much misinformation out there that holding up boundaries for that long for the brain, that long for the brain. That's why there's, when people ask me, I've been an interventionist for 15 years, never had the power of the state to take somebody's civil rights away. But as long as the family did what we asked, we always checked them in eventually. Because substances have to have help to exist. Mental health, untreated mental health issues and untreated substances have to have help to exist. When you don't have a properly working frontal cortex, you cannot exist in the stream of life. Consequences would hit you if you don't have family preventing those consequences from hitting you. In terms of family support and helping clients with early recovery uh, and upholding boundaries, this is the general subtext of the question. What is too much support and not enough support? You know, I, I I pre I know I know where you go. I appreciate we we will get there. We're that's ahead of the. We're going to talk about boundaries and all that. Uh, we, we're great question. We'll get there. And I've got a I've got a break. And this is a three hour lecture I'm doing in two hours. I know it's like drinking out of a fire hose. And so we're getting ready to break. But see, this is the uh, what you're dealing with. You're talking about dual diagnosis, like that's depression and that's substance use disorder. Regardless of what came first, when you walk in that door, can you tell the difference between the two? Or if you're a psychiatrist, can you tell the difference 30 minutes once a month? I love when, when you're a psych or a therapist, 50 minutes once a week. And so I tell, you know, our treatment is not psychotherapy based. It is not psychotherapy based. It is program based. It is behavioral based. I said, how would you, how could you possibly diagnose that brain? I can't tell you how many people have come in with bipolar diagnoses. I said, they're coming off of meth and Xanax. I'd be a little up and down too. <laughs> How does their brain heal? How does their uh, how does their brain heal? How does the neuroplasticity happen? But you know, that's a, that's what uh, co-occurring disorders look like. I said, how could you possibly neglect one for the other, or get an idea of what that is? Fifty minutes once a week, or think one-on-one -on -one therapy is what you need. I said it's so much more complex than that. And those of you, when I said that uh, substance of abuse affect the body differently initially, I said that's what it. You know, if we thought that that worked, we'd separate that, we separate treatment centers that way. It doesn't work. It affects the body differently initially, but in the end, in the long run, it affects the body in the same way. It takes a long time to come back. Neuroplasticity, the retraining of the brain's pathways. There's every bit of two years to stabilize this, every bit. So neuroplasticity, the retraining of the brain's pathways. And there's only so much you can do to speed that up. Only so much you can do to speed that up. Everything that we do here is based in functional neuroscience, even yoga. It's not just a time filler. It's actually called vestibular functioning. It helps you with your brain balance and brain healing. Everything we do is based in how, helping that brain heal quicker. And the brain heals through consistency, not intensity. 
the brain heals through consistency, not intensity. Just like, you know, you don't get in shape for going to the gym 48 hours in a row the first weekend in January. How many of us did that? You get in shape by going one hour every day consistently. And yes, it's boring. And yes, it's the same thing over and over. And yes, you've heard it before. And yes, you've heard it again. And that's exactly how the brain heals through consistency. How many of you parents and family members have heard that? Oh, I've heard it all before. I just know what I need to do. I've done this all before. It's the same old stuff over and over again. I said, yes, and that's exactly how the brain heals through consistency, not intensity. And the idea that understanding of the misconception of what a, a relapse is, in fact, that's another term that we don't use here. It's actually called reoccurrence. So many people think a, a relapse is a failure. Well, the idea, it has the same reoccurrence rate as diseases like hypertension, asthma, diabetes. My autoimmune condition is called relapsing polychondritis. Reoccurrences are a part of healthcare issues. They are not failures. I can't stand the statement they're a part of the recovery process because I don't believe that, but they're often a part of the change process. And they're not failures. And the reoccurrences, that's what they are. I tell families, don't judge success by days, week. Look at it in 90-day chunks. If somebody stays sober 88 days and has two reoccurrences, how much healthier is that than the previous 90 days? or the six months before that, or the six months before that. Our goal and expectation for you isn't perfect absence. We know that can be achieved, but that's not the expectation, for you to be perfect. Our goal for each and every one of you is to become happy, healthy, and more connected. We know that substances and untreated mental health are the ultimate disconnector. You know, but just because you have a reoccurrence doesn't mean that that's a failure. We treat it with the appropriate level of rever reverence and it's not a punishment either, so don't say that. It's like when I get told that I have another infusion for my condition next week because my symptoms increased, I don't tell the doctor, why are you punishing me? And so if you have a reoccurrence, that's just your disease symptoms increasing. You need more treatment. It's not punishment. Just like any other healthcare condition. If you added medicine, when would you ever tell the doctor, stop punishing me? It's a healthcare condition. So. It's about following the professional. This is just like any other disease. If I write you a prescription for 20 antibiotics in 20 days, prognosis is better if you take them like you're prescribed. If 10 days in, you Google WebMD or do you decide what you want to do or let emotions lead it, prognosis is not going to be that good. And if you want to think, those of you the guys have been to treatment centers or 30-day treatment centers that I said, you know, uh, that probably didn't give you the best advice, I can also say, there's probably some of you who say, well, that treatment center didn't work. And I'll probably say, did you follow the aftercare plan? Nope, they said. So you didn't follow the professional's advice. No kidding, it didn't work. And so just like any other disease, you follow the professional's advice, the higher the prognosis. And so um, <clears throat> we're going to, I'm about five minutes behind, but it's one of the last things I want to say before we break is there's always somebody when I used to do this lecture in, at Betty Ford, when um, when going over the disease concept, that they get the idea that it's a disease. I'd, I'd say, how many of you guys believe that this is a disease? And everybody would raise their hand. I'd say, how many of you guys are just raising your hand because you'd look like a jackass if you didn't and half the hands would go down? And I'd say, well, why don't you believe it's a disease? And whether it's, it's a choice or willpower, or I had an uncle that could just stop. All of the reasons I ever heard boiled down to human behavior. It's like, why can't human behavior be a disease? I said, okay, let's, let's go with that because diabetes and coronary artery disease can both be brought on by unhealthy human behavior. If you don't eat right and you don't exercise, your body can biologically shift and you can develop diabetes. If you don't eat right and you don't exercise, your body can biologically shift and you can develop coronary artery disease. Not everybody who doesn't eat right and exercise, but those with predisposition and exposure have a higher likelihood. And so why do we have such a hard time with this? 10 people have a beer, statistically speaking, one person's brain is gonna biologically shift. Symptoms just look different. Like coronary artery disease look like high blood pressure and you know diabetes look like dysregulation and insulin. A brain disorder without a frontal cortex looks like poor choices. But it's a brain disorder. And the disease concept doesn't take away responsibility. It takes away fault. It's not your fault that you developed the disease. It's not your fault that my body developed an autoimmune disease. It's my responsibility to take my medicine. I have to take 12 immunosuppressants every day to keep me alive. If I don't take them, the disease is going to get me. 
And those are the consequences. It's unfair and it's the reality. And so it removes fault. It doesn't remove responsibility. You still got to take your medicine every day. It's still your duty to get treated. And so a lot of people have a hard time with the disease concept because it, it removes, they think it removes uh, responsibility. It does not remove responsibility. You still got a responsibility to take your medicine every day. And so the idea that emotions, that motivation as even Brandy referred to it, the emotions, whether it's love or want or uh, you know, in, being motivated, that, that, doesn't, that does not change human behavior. We know that even from studying behavior and actions change human behavior. It's actually called behavioral design you know, in, our, in psycho psychology, behavioral design. So what does that mean? That just means we need compliance right now. We need people to show up, like I said, suit up and show up, come in here and fake it until you make it. And that's how the, the brain begins to heal. You know, it takes two years to stabilize this. But in the middle of all this, during that time, you know, up until you get to the point, you know, with all of these issues, all the, the chaos, all the healthcare system that doesn't know how to treat it, all the in and out of treatment centers, you know, family members, it's thrown at your feet. It's thrown at your feet. Like I said, this is through no fault of your own. You come in here and you're trauma bonded on the identified patient. You're trauma bonded on the identified patient. But if I were to ask you how you were doing, you would answer me according to what you knew about your identified patient. Even relationships within the family cannot exist independently without talking about the identified patient. Everything is enmeshed with the identified patient. You know, that's what you need to uh, survive. That's what your brain has developed. It's traumatic. It's traumatic. Understanding of that is what happens to family members. And so an understanding of that trauma bond and what impact it has on the family is what we're gonna go through in part two. Because this whole process is about taking the identified patient out of the center. Stop focusing on just one person with the disease and focus on the general family disease. And what you guys, what I call the sphere of influence, you know, what can you do? You know, what is it that you can do to play a role into helping with this compliance, helping with yourself, helping the family? But how do we get out of, you know, this mode of being trauma bonded? Because that's how you guys come in here, is just connected to that identified patient. It controls every moment of every life. I tell people it's like being attached to a silverback gorilla. And so we're going to take a break, Erica, for five minutes, four minutes, five minutes. And we're going to come back. We're actually going to come back and talk about what happens to the family members and the family members' brains as a result of this. So five minutes.
if you can give me the thumbs up when we're, are we ready? Okay, guys, if we can get, if you can bear, bear with me. Hey, guys. One of the things about, um, hey, guys. Hello, hey, everybody. One of the things about this is that really this is a, a three, three to six hour workshop that are trying to do in two hours. So I know it's like drinking out of a, a fire hose unless people want to be here till 11, 12 o'clock, which I'm happy to stay here and talk as you guys obviously can see. Um, we want to get uh, started with the second half of this uh, material and really get into, like we talked about the family portion. And there's something really important that uh, that was at the end of that that I wanted to address when it comes to this slide that we were talking about when when I said that um, whenever I was working at, at Betty Ford in the first day, I'd ask everybody there, how many of you guys, you know, think this is disease and, and you know, everybody would raise their hand and put their hands down and we'd go through that process. And then ultimately everybody would accept that it's a disease. And unequivocally, there's always one person that would raise their hand and very honestly say, and my husband, my spouse had 10 years sober, 20 years sober, and had a reoccurrence. Their brain was healed and they chose to pick up again. And that's a choice. I said, I, I hear you. And that's not accurate. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, in the recovery world, they would say that you're a pickle never to be a cucumber again. You know, actually, when it, when it comes to understanding neuroscience, there's something called procedural learning. And that means impact on your brain that your brain can't unlearn. Like riding a bike is procedural learning in neuroscience terms. Like I haven't been able to ride a bike or exercise since I was 18. But if you bought a pink beach cruiser in here with the basket and tassels, I could hop on it and ride it. I haven't forgotten. Because it's procedural learning is learning your brain can't unlearn. Substance use disorders, the impact on the brain is considered and classified as procedural learning to the brain. That means that's learning that your brain can't unlearn. It's like, well, great. What does that mean? And anytime that you have unhealthy procedural learning habits, in order to combat those, you have to develop healthy competing habits. And that takes a while. Case in point, there is a wonderful uh, YouTube that went viral about a neuroscientist riding a bike. And he transposed the handlebars on the bike. So if you turn the bike, it went this way. And if you turned it to this way, it went the opposite way. And he did a study that he said, it'll just take a couple of days or weeks, figured out how to, take, how to ride his bike. It took nine months for him to figure out how to ride that bike. Because that's how long neuroplasticity takes. The retraining of the brain's pathways consistently over and over and over again. It's a wonderful YouTube. It captures this very well. Yeah, no, it's... Well, actually, little guys learn languages and things a whole lot differently. It's completely different than what I'm talking about. Is when you're talking about you know, zero to seven, that means you can learn, that's when you can learn languages and your body just absorbs it quicker. Our adult brains take nine months. Neuroplasticity takes nine months, very much like substances. When you've heard that somebody's had a reoccurrence after a long period of time, what do we usually hear? That the reoccurrence started well before the first drink. They stopped doing the behavioral health habits. What you see here is this is somebody 10 years sober, 10 years abstinent. And they showed them an image of a nature and the limbic system didn't light up. And they showed him a video of his drug of choice and it lit up like a Christmas tree. And this is called the neuroscience of triggers. And quote unquote, normal people don't have to deal with this. Once he already has a substance use disorder, he's a pickle, never be a cucumber again. You know, that's why... We tell people that um, uh, you, know, you take your medicine every day. I'm 15, 16 years sober. My, I'll go visit my brother. And he said, you still have to go to those meetings? I was like, yeah, why would I, why would I stop? You know, if you stop taking, when you hear that somebody's had a reoccurrence, that means they stopped taking their medicine several months ago and they, they didn't have the skills and the tools to, uh, to overcome the trigger when it happened. It's not like when you're 20 years sober, then you're doing and you're taking medicine, all of a sudden you're going to get a whiff of, beer and all of a sudden tear off like a madman it's like you, once you stop doing the procedural learning habits you put yourself more at risk more at risk more at risk they stop taking your medicine every day 
That's called the science of, of uh, this memory of drugs, the, the science of triggers, the science of creams. You're a pickle never to be a cucumber again. And so that's why even when you're 20 years sober and you have a reoccurrence, just because you use again, that doesn't make it a complete choice. Yes, it's a part of it, but it doesn't, doesn't take into account the triggers and cravings of this. The responsibility is not in the action. The responsibility is you stopped taking your medicine months ago. Stop taking your medicine months ago. And so that's called the science of triggers and cravings. And uh, just because they're uh, sober, like doesn't mean you have to stop what they're doing and stop taking their medicine every day. And so um, getting back to what we talked about as we ended, sort of the trauma bond that you guys come in here with. This is how families come in here. The trauma that you guys are, are forced, just like, and this happens with any disease. Let me make that clear, any disease that family members are five times more likely to be in the hospital if they have a family member suffering from a progressive disease, any progressive disease. If you have a family member suffering from any progressive disease, family members are five times more likely to be in the hospital. So why is that? What goes on with you guys? And what do we do about it? Now, how do we even begin to understand what goes on and what do we do about it? The first thing we need to understand is this, this information you know, what we're going through is going to be uncomfortable. You know, the pain that brought you here, this is actually the spark, sort of the pilot light, what I call the, that's why we call our alumni change agents that can create change in a family. I can't tell you how many families, when I say it takes two years to stabilize this, the PTSD symptoms. And the fact is that if you do the necessary work, we actually know you can increase gray matter in your brain. It's actually called post-traumatic growth. I can't tell you how many families end up closer, more connected than they ever were as a result of doing the work. Post-traumatic stress, if you treat it properly, creates post-traumatic growth. And so there's a wonderful quote that says, God whispers in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Because that's what brought you here. You identified patients. That's why we call you the change agents, because you can be the tip and the spark that creates incredible family healing that goes back generations that your families needed to heal from, all because... You are the reason why everybody's here, not to treat you, but I'm sorry, families, that's not what you came here for. Sorry to uh, debate and switch you, but we're here to put the down the microscope on the identified patient, pick up the mirror on yourself. You know, that's what we're here for. And it's going to suck. There's some parts of this that's, it's going to be uncomfortable. But what in, what in life worth doing it isn't hard to do. You know, the reality is, there's some things in life that we don't have a choice over. Pain, trials, and tribulations is something that we don't have a choice over. We will experience those. How you show up to those, how you process them, what you do when you interface with them, you do have a choice in that. You do have influ influence in that. And so you absolutely have a choice. And this is about arming you with the tools of, to get the self-awareness of what to do. And so what do family members and, and families do when they're in the midst of this trauma? Because make no mistake, having a loved one with this disease is traumatic. Whether it's a spouse, whether it's a child, it's traumatic. I was two years sober before I realized my parents suffered far more than I ever did. And so if we're gonna understand what families go through, we're gonna first take a look at just human beings' behaviors in general. Because this isn't exclusive to substance use disorders or mental health, like I said, this is a human being issue. If you have a family member with any progressive illness, family members are five times more likely to be in the hospital. So it's a human being issue. And so an understanding of how human beings behave is a significant uh, fact that we, we must come to grips with. Human beings' behavior, we're not that uh, mysterious. I know there's some people that you guys think you're mysterious, but we're really not. And so all of our behaviors, even if we go back to caveman days, you know, our bodies and brains were built with one purpose and one purpose only, built to survive. And so why is it that we were the species that not only survived, but thrived? I mean, look at the world we built. I mean, why are we the ones that survived and thrived? We're not the smartest species. We're not the strongest. And so why is it that we not only survived, but thrived? Why do you think? Say a lot work together. So we have to live in community. That's exactly why. We're not the smartest. We're not the strongest. It's not because we adapt. The flying fish adapts. And so it's because we, we have to work and live in community. We're, we're 
but social creatures have to be safe, secure, connected to survive. And actually our behavior is really a balance of four chemicals. Like I said, it's not that mysterious, the balance of four chemicals. And they're, they're actually very specific chemicals. And I, I call it EDSO, like endorphins and dopamine or what we call selfish chemicals because you don't eat, need anybody to get those. And serotonin and oxytocin are what I call selfless chemicals because you need other people to get those. And the balance of these chemicals really dictates our behavior. And so what do I mean by that is endorphins. Endorphins are what your body uh, has in your body's response to pain. It's actually your body's natural opiate. It's called a peptide. You know, they're built for endurance to mask physical pain. If you think about uh, uh, caveman days, we weren't the strongest and weren't the smartest, but we could track that saber tooth tiger for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. We had wonderful endurance. How many of you guys are runners or exercises? I'm allergic, so God bless you. I'm allergic to that run. But you get this second wind. It's called a runner's high. You, know, you run, if you, you marathon runners that you got 19 miles to run, you run, you run, you run, you run, you run, you get this burst of energy, you feel great, burst through the inner, burst through the finish line. And then a few, few hours later, you're doubled over in pain because the damage you did to your muscles before, because that's what it's there. Endorphins are there to mask physical pain, endurance. They hit your system, they hit your system, hit your system as you're running, you're tracking that saber tooth tiger. It's your second wind, your runner's high. Also, what else creates endorphins? Laughing. How many of you guys have laughed so hard it hurts because you're convulsing your organs? You laugh, you, you, uh, you disperse endorphins, you laugh so long, endorphins go away, it hurts. And so laugh, go for a run, you can build endurance, but that's what they're made for. Endorphins are made to mask physical pain. Dopamine is what I call society's nemesis. There's a wonderful article that we are a dopamine-driven society. Motiv dopamine was created for one purpose and one purpose only, to motivate us toward our goals, to help us achieve our goals. How many of you guys are to-do list makers? I'm one, and we love crossing things off on that list. And what happens during the day when we do something that's not on that list that we do? We write it on the list just so we can cross it off because it feels good. <laughs> it's exactly what we do. We need the dopamine. It's exactly what we do. It helps us get to it focuses us toward our goals. And even the anticipation of accomplishing that motivates us. The reason why we had that is because when in caveman days, there was no guarantee we'd get food if we had to wait until we were hungry. And so even the anticipation of the event triggers dopamine. It focuses us toward us, our goals. It's the feeling you get when you found something you look for, when you accomplish. It's very visual. That's why you say, write down your goals. You can accomplish it. So I say, don't go to the grocery store without a list. It's like you need to, uh, it's like, um, the reason why if I saw an apple tree and I was hungry, it would, it would focus, it would focus, it would focus and hyper-focus on that, uh, that goal. And that's what dopamine does. It focuses us on our goal. It motivates us toward our goal. The problem with that and why it makes it so new, it's very short-term, very instant, but you can trick your brain into thinking you need this to survive. And that's when dopamine becomes out of balance. It's not dopamine and the dopamine action in itself that's unhealthy. It's the out of balance. So what did I say earlier in the lecture that we're the most obese, addicted, medicated, in debt adult society ever? And that dopamine driven behaviors and your phone, just dopamine driven. It's called the gamification of technology. In fact, they invented technology and the smartphone and apps at the Stanford Institute of Persuasion. They studied your brain when they built those apps of how to trigger and keep you addicted. And uh, we know if we think about dopamine driven behaviors, they're very short term, eating, sex, gambling, drugs, alcohol, all dopamine driven behaviors. In fact, chocolate increases dopamine by 50 percent. Sex increases it by 100 percent. Nicotine by 150 percent compared to cocaine and uh, amphetamines is a thousand percent. And so these dopamine driven behaviors, if you think about it, it's not the when you talk about whether it's overeating or overexercise or, or process addictions like gambling and sex. It's not the singular act that's unhealthy. It's the out of balance. It's when, when it becomes dopamine driven. And the other part about dopamine is it, it helps regulate brain chemistry. It helps regulate oxytocin. It helps regulate your frontal cortex. And so when that dopamine is dysregulated, you don't have a frontal cortex. Well, that controls empathy. That's why so many family members think I've got somebody who's a sociopath 
because all they want is their, whatever it is, their dopamine driven behavior. They don't think about anybody else. They don't care about anybody else. They don't care about consequences. They don't have any empathy. They're a sociopath. So I know they just don't have a frontal cortex that controls empathy. If you think of any dopamine addict, sex, drugs, work, gambling, how are their relationships or their resources? Usually not good because relationships and resources go by that if you get hyper-focused and hyper-focused and hyper-focused, you lose your frontal cortex, you lose your judgment and reasoning, you teach your brain, you need that to survive. And so even eat, uh, sex, gambling, drugs, alcohol, smoking, we actually have age limits on most of those, but we don't have age limits on social media. And so we wonder why we're, we're teaching these, but that's, that's how you medicate. I need that, I need that, I need that. Like I said, the trauma of being unfriended, the likes, the buzz, just think about that dopamine hit that we're all attracted to the most obese, addicted, medicated, in-debt adult society ever. The problem with this is very short-term, very instant gratification. And when you become dopamine-driven, relationships and resources go by the wayside. Like I said, your frontal cortex is not working. Empathy, judgment, reasoning goes by the wayside. And your brain is telling you you need that to survive. What I tell uh, parents who, who family members who want to tell the identified patients a liar and a cheat, it's like, not exactly. I said, it's, it's similar to when I was on the Outer Banks, I was a lifeguard. And every summer they taught us how to, how to swim. And every summer they had to train us to how to save the tourists that's swimming in the red flags that we asked them not to. And every time that we went to save them, they would try to drown us. They weren't intentionally trying to murder us. And their dopamine kicked in and it was fight or flight. It felt like that to the lifeguard. It still felt like I was drowning. You know, but that tourist wasn't trying to murder me. Just as fight or flight kicked in, scratch, claw, kick to the top. That's the same way with uh, out of balance dopamine with this disease. How many of you family members felt scratch, claw, lie, cheat, steal to get to the top? Because their brain is saying, I need this to survive. And if you stand in the way of that, they're going to scratch, claw, kick to get to the top. It doesn't mean they're intentionally trying to lie to you. It still feels like that to you. I'm not saying to trust them. And intent does matter. Just like that person drowning is not trying to murder you. It still feels that way to the lifeguard. You still have to prepare, but they're still not a murderer. And so it's just an understanding. It doesn't excuse the behavior. It just gives you context for it. And so the problem is when you're out of balance dopamine, just like our entire society is, there's no fulfillment. Relationships and resources go by the wayside. Very superficial, very short term. And the problem with that is identified patients out of balance dopamine because of the substances or the mental health issue. What do you think is the dopamine trigger of the family? The identified patient becomes your dopamine trigger. That's what you hyper-focus on. You need to know, need to know, need to know in order to regulate your own emotions. The patient's life's overwhelmed by the mental health issues or the substances. Your life is overwhelmed by the identified patient. That's what you hyper-focus on. That's your drug. And I need to know, I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. And so when you come in here and you say, what are they doing? Are they going to this? Are they doing this? Are they having this? Are they getting this? Are they getting this? And our question was like, oh, how many meetings are they going to? And our, if we say, oh, how many are you going to? You don't like that question. Because you need to know, you need to know, you need to know. And through no fault of your own, that's the way the healthcare system has created it. Because you're the reason why they're alive, because the healthcare system wasn't there. And so you did your job. And... Now, when it's time to heal, it's like it's you're no longer the, the, the player and the coach. It's time for you to step aside and heal, too. And understanding that your dopamine's out of whack, too. Hyper-focused and hyper-focused and hyper-focused. That's why gotten your relationships and resources are going by the wayside. And so, and understand, and what happens when that? We isolate ourselves. Relationships and resources go by the wayside, and we're alone, and we actually cut off our healthy relationships. The problem with that serotonin and oxytocin, you need other relationships in order to, for your brain to heal. It's called serotonin and oxytocin. Serotonin is the healthy self-esteem chemical. It's often referred to as the leadership chemical. Those of you who study leadership books, John Maxwell, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, Gary Vandercheck, all their leadership stuff is based in this. It's the leadership chemical, healthy self-esteem. It stabilizes mood. You get it through esteemable acts, acts of kindness, sunlight. It's measurable. Serotonin is measurable. Low serotonin directly correlates to depression. That's why our, our most, one of our most potent antidepressants is SSRIs. 
serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They keep more serotonin in the synapse, directly correlated to depression. And if you isolate, it goes down. This is about feeling healthy pride, healthy, esteemable acts. That's also why it's uh, one of the most viral YouTubes is a five-star general giving a commencement speech at Texas saying, if you want to be successful in this world, start by making your bed. Little acts of self-esteem. You build your self-esteem. It actually helps your brain to heal. That's actually essential for young adults' brain healing. And this is a statement that's real important. And we'll talk more about it tomorrow. But young adults, what I consider 18 to 30-ish, and the way their brain has to heal when it comes to substances is different than you know, a 40 or 50 year old because of the way the brain heals, how plastic it, it is. Also in the stages of development, the goals to help somebody is far more than just become an abstinence, it's helping them become autonomous and develop life skills. The best and most clinically optimal environment for a young adult brain is outside the parent's home. It is unequivocal and unquestionable. All of the evidence shows it's five to seven times higher prognosis if they just spend 90 days in a gender uh, structured sober living outside the parent's home. Has absolutely no indictment on the state of the, fa the family, their marriage. That's about you. Has everything to do with how the brain heals and how the brain heals in their environment, help them become autonomous. And when they become 18, 19, their brain has to experience certain things that they will not experience under their mom's and dad's roof subconsciously. It's so much more than, than just a sober environment. It helps them become autonomous, develop a, uh, independence and autonomy. It helps their brain to heal. I'm not saying that it can't happen in your house. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just telling you that the best and clinically optimal environment is absolutely outside the parent's home. And that's how the brain heals because it's so much more than just stopping the chemical consumption. It's about developing esteemable acts. Trust me, there's failure to thrive. That 40-year-old still in the mom's basement, no matter what he says, he doesn't have healthy self-esteem. That, that uh, young adult that's still in the mom's basement or still living with the parents, there's still a tremendous amount of guilt and shame there. Just is. And that's what this, in general, with this disease and how it helps. And when you ever you hear failure to thrive cases, that's about the parents. It's not about the child. It's about the, the parents' inability to change and adapt. That's about them. Most of the time, it's also because the parents don't want to be in the house by themselves because they're staring across from a stranger. Or they'll have to change the way that their behavior is. That's what should happen. When you go from 19, 18 to 19, you're going from an independent, to, I mean, a dependent to an independent. And learning how to do that in a healthy environment with proper bedded structure. I'm not saying they get a, an apartment in the uh, by themselves. That's not what this isn't a polarizing conversation. But a healthy, structured, properly guided environment is what they need. It's how their brain heals. It's called a, it's, it's about functional neuroscience. We also know that self worth and self respect. That's also about self, serotonin. That's why gratitude letters are functional neuroscience help increase uh, activity in the frontal cortex. It's not just busy work. You know, just gratitude letter writing consistently day in and day out. Loneliness and depression correlated with bullying and isolation. That's why, you know, having a family member that, you know, grew up feeling like a nerd and isolated, anxious and stressed. The first time he went to Comic-Con, he felt confident he belonged in the first time. It's just because he felt like he belonged, connected, had healthy self-esteem. Said first time, never felt depression when I was around people that I felt belonged. Said that's biology. That's not psychology. We need this serotonin. It's part of what we need. It's, I said, it's biology. So like I said, the leadership chemical, so about, like there's a wonderful book actually written by a friend of mine's wife who actually was a prostitute in the early eighties, got sober, became a lawyer and wrote a book called Esteemable Acts. It's a wonderful book to talk about how esteemable acts help your brain heal. And especially when you're talking about substance use disorders and how the brain heals, certainly with young adults who need to develop and assimilate life skills and their own autonomy outside the parent's home. And then oxytocin is the healthy brain's favorite chemical and most important chemical. It's actually called the cuddle chemical. It happens at childbirth, attachment, friendship. It's the, uh, the neuroscience chemical responsible for trust, connection, and belonging. And those just aren't woo-woo lanyard terms. Those are biological needs. Trust. How many of you guys that, uh, you know, in your 
what you feel like this in your small group. When you walk in there the first day, you don't feel like you trust anybody. You're not going to open up and be vulnerable. But you go in there consistently. Oxytocin takes a long time to develop. It's the opposite of dopamine. It's not short term. It's long term. Develop trust. The more oxytocin you develop, the more trust, the more belonging, the safer you feel. Oxytocin is very measurable. We can measure this at childbirth. One of the best examples I can give is at childbirth, oxytocin explodes in the mother and the child. That's why there's this instant spiritual connection that the dad just doesn't have. Because the dad comes into my office three weeks later, it's like, something's wrong with me, I'm a bad dad. All the thing does is eating shit all day and I don't have it, I'm a bad dad. But they, it takes, they develop it, it just takes longer. They don't get it instantly like a mother. It just takes longer because oxytocin takes long to develop and you need other people. Healthy touch, healthy touch in, uh, increases oxytocin. That's why when you hear teens say, man, they have a lot of chemistry. They're high-fiving and chest bumping and putting their arms. Healthy touch increases oxytocin. So it's the opposite of dopamine. It's the very difference between having sex and making love. And you all know what I mean by that. One's very short-term, very instant. One's very long-term, very trust connection. It's biological. And oxytocin is a direct substance use disorder inhibitor. We need connection to survive. We need trust. We need connection to survive. It's biology. And I love when people tell me the 12 steps is just religious based because the 12 steps are all based in the balance of these chemicals. It's all based in neuroscience. If you think about steps one, two, three, four, and five, you don't need anybody. It's just you stopping the dopamine driven behavior. But then if you look at step five, all of a sudden you need somebody and you take your inventory, you do the esteemable acts, you feel better about yourself. You make amends at step nine. And then what happens at step 12? Oxytocin is about service and doing stuff for others. And what do you know? We hold hands and healthy touch at the end of a meeting. It's all based in neuroscience. There's a wonderful book that uh, years ago, I put a physician into treatment who was very data-driven, very scientific-driven, who didn't believe in this God 12-step BS. But the diversion program forced him to comply. And he stayed sober. And he wanted to know the evidence-based reasons why he did it. So he wrote a book called Hijacking the Brain, the Neuroscience of the 12 Steps. It's a wonderful book. And that's not to say the 12 Steps is the only way because we support smart recovery, celebrate recovery, 12-step recovery. Because I love when people argue, argue the differences because they all say the same thing. You can't, you got to come consistently. You got to have group. You need to have a mentor or a sponsor uh, to help you guide. Is it, and you can't do it by yourself. Say that again. You need a group. You need to come consistently. You need a mentor or a sponsor. And you can't do it by yourself. They all say the same thing. Because it's all based in this. That's why it works. All based. It's a, oxytocin is a direct dopamine inhibitor. We know that. You know, we, we know that's the evidence. And no, there's no pill you can take to increase the dopamine. There's always somebody to ask. The, the brain is so complex, the networks, and there's no way that you can get a pill that directly increased oxytocin. That's not the way it works. It takes time to develop that trust connection. That's just something that takes time. It's long-term. You know, that's, that's why it's, you guys know what I mean when you feel like you're connect when you walk into a small group, you guys feel it just in here. You guys will feel it tomorrow by 11 o'clock. You feel a lot safer and you trust this group the more than you did at 530. Because it's starting to develop. And the balance of these chemicals is what drives our behavior. But you need other people to survive. That's why, why get social anxiety? I just need one-on-one. -on -one. I said, no, no, no. I hear you. That's not how your brain is going to heal. You need to be around people. I get that you don't be in line groups. I get it. I understand. And you've got to learn to do that in order for your brain to heal. We're treating the anxiety. And you've got to lean into that discomfort to treat it. That's, what, that's how the brain heals. You know, when somebody has dementia, they don't tell you to do a crossword puzzle every day. They tell you to do a crossword puzzle and a different puzzle and a different puzzle because the friction and the discomfort is actually what drives the brain healing and the resiliency. And so it's the doing leaning into the discomfort, which is what our body naturally shies us away from, is what we have to do here. You know, but oxytocin is what drives, uh, you know, that connection. That's what drives that, that spiritual, that trust that we have to have. Like I said, it's the difference between sex and making love. We all know what that means. One is instant, one is not. <clears throat> and so this neuroscience of belonging and connection, connection, like I said, is not psychology. It is biology. You know, with this loss, you know, our brain like reacts like it's a physical injury. It affects us somatically. It affects us physically. 
So that's why when families and patients come into our office, both of you are looking like walking corpses because it takes its toll. You know, that isolation. We know lonely people do not live as long. We need other people to survive happy, healthy. We need to feel like we uh, connect. The brain activates reward circuits when this serotonin and oxytocin get going. The only problem is when you've got that dopamine driven behavior that's made to overpower that fight or flight, if that dictates things, it's when you go down that shame spiral and you get further and further away. That's why family members, you're out of balance dopamine and identified patients, what your brain is telling you you want or you need probably is what's unhealthy. That's why when it comes to both of you, whoever we stand in the way of what their dopamine is, we're the bad guy. Meaning I was an interventionist and or still am. And I'd come in when the family's in chaos, when the identified patient, and I'd come in and intervene on the patient and put them in the treatment. And then the family would love me the moment they're in treatment and they want to know what's going on with them, what's going on. I said, no, 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 it's time for us to treat and you to do the work. And no, I become the bad guy then. It's like, what are they doing? Are they going to this? Are they going to that? Are they going? I said, no, no, we're not going to talk about them. So I want to ask you how you're doing and you're not even allowed to say their name. So we're focused on you. Don't like that. It's because whoever you're standing in the way of their dopamine, they're going to scratch, call, get to the top. And that's family members too. That's why as in the professional community, our number one barrier to treating clients or family members, our number one barrier, not even close. You ask a hundred professionals and a hundred professionals will tell you that. Our number one barrier is family members. And it's not intentional. There's not one person in here that it is intentional. It's your body's natural compulsion. It's your body's natural compulsion. And it's your trauma. It's the post-traumatic stress symptoms. It's the healthcare system threw it at your feet and you had to do it at the time. And so those are the symptoms with family members we have to treat. And when you don't have that connection and when you don't, when you have that isolation and you, you keep going down that shame spiral, your brain doesn't heal. This is the brain of somebody with just emotional abuse. You don't see how, you see how their frontal cortex doesn't develop. And so your brain has to have it to survive. The balance of these four chemicals, that really dictates our behavior. But the, the problem with our society and our, with this disease is the stress that we go through. Is you throw adrenaline and cortisol are the stress chemicals that hit our system. And those are wonderful survival chemicals that are supposed to hit your system and leave for three minutes. There's actually a wonderful book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, written by Robert Sapolsky, that talks about chronic stress in our society. The basis of the book is stress is meant for a purpose. If like if a lion is at a zebra, then for three screaming mi minutes, the zebra gets the hell out of the way. Good system. But what happens when that's in your system all the time? Isn't that traumatic? Like when I was at the worst of my disease, my mother called my house every morning at 6.30 a.m. And I thought she was being the overbearing mother that she still is. But when I went through this process, I found out she was just calling to see if I was alive. And it wasn't an overreaction. It wasn't a hyperbolic response to where my disease was after several treatment centers and overdoses and psych wards. She had valid reason to wonder if I was dead or alive every day. What other scenario other than having a loved one deployed to war. And I'm not comparing war and the disease, but I'm comparing what family members go through. What other scenario than having a loved one deployed to war do family members have valid mortality level stress moment to moment, day to day? Don't you think that's traumatic? A death by a thousand cuts is still a death. Trauma doesn't have to be a capital T or a bullet or you know, death by a thousand cuts day in and day out is still traumatic, still trauma. And it's not exclusive to this disease. You parents think about my, my mom, my mother and father when I was 18 as an athlete, July of that year, kicking down their bedroom door at 2 a.m. going, <laughs> not able to breathe, turning blue. And then having an oxygen tank and a trach to breathe. How much sleep do you think they got in the next three or four years? Think they got any sleep? You think chronic stress, anxiety all the time? worrying about if their child was going to survive. And I saw what happened with my family, the dynamics that happened with my family when that disease hit my, then I saw what happened when addiction hit and they were the same thing, that chronic stress that happened. And so it's not your fault. So please, the most important thing to validate is, and it's not your fault and it's grossly unfair 
It's actually not called codependency. It's actually called the stress coping paradigm, caregiver stress. It's actually a very human being condition. I'd be really worried if you didn't have it. You know, that stress that uh, what caused the trauma that you guys feel. And what happens when we know that you've got escalated stress under extreme stress, your frontal lobe shuts down and your hyper limbic system hyperactivates. What does that sound like? The identified patient, right? That's what stress does to the family member's brain. And you have that stress and it shuts off your frontal cortex and hyperactivates your limbic system. And that sound like the identified patient. You wonder why they say you go through a parallel process. One of the one of the books, the family members' books, even for adolescents, is called Pat Parallel Process. It's because it's what you guys go through, very validly surviving the trauma. It's a trauma cycle. You get in hypervigilance, reactivity, reactivity, habituation. You draw the line, you draw the line, you draw the line, and then complete avoidance behavior, polarizing avoidance behavior, extremes. It's called the trauma cycle, the trauma context. It's what you guys go through. But you can judge the temperature of the room right when you walk in it. I mean, just to judge the, how many of you guys feel like you can judge the temperature of the room, the smell, the trigger, the, what you got family members experience, the chronic stress all the time, you know, the masks you wear are guiding it. I don't want to walk down the street because I don't want to talk to Cindy Lou because I don't want to hear about her child graduating college or her husband or wife with a job when my treatment center is my child or family members in the seventh treatment center. Just the mask that you have to wear, the stress that compounds it. You go to the healthcare system for help and they tell you you really have to want it to get better and just Google WebMD. Just, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I did this lecture on a, on a podcast and the dad was blown away and he was like, what, I just had a three-year-old child. How do I learn how to be a good dad so this doesn't happen to my child? I said, Brian, the first thing you need to understand is you can be a great dad and it's still happened to your child. Would you say that if it was cancer? You can be a great parent and it's still, still happening. So this is a disease. And it's difficult. And I, I call it the, the stigma that very, very accurately and understandably affects you guys' judgment is the stigma that we feel. I call it the casserole syndrome. And it's different than spouses and parents. One's not worse. Like if you have a, a spouse in treatment or a partner in treatment versus a child, like there's some things that are different. I'm not saying one's worse than the other, but they are different. In some areas, the, the world has much more empathy for the spouse. Like, I can't believe you put up with that drunk jackass ward. The world may tend to have more empathy for you. But for parents, it's not the same. And I call that the casserole syndrome. And what I mean by that is when I was 18 and I got sick in the small town of Roanoke Island, Everybody in the town came over and gave us casseroles. It's baked tetrazzini. It stings my nostrils. I've got trauma of baked tetrazzini, how much of that crap I ate. Every time I tell this lecture, I can feel it. It's like we live in it. <laughs> well, when I survived all that, and five years later, substance use disorders hit my life, how many casseroles were in my refrigerator? None. In fact, it was quite the opposite. The neighborhood told my not to hang out with us. And so that compounds the stress and anxiety. Don't you think that influences your judgment and reasoning and decision-making? Understandably, understandably. It's not an indictment on parenting. It's just a fact of being human. And that's what, you know, codependency is. That's why we really, we only use that in just definition terms. Actually, the definition is, it is a, an extreme preoccupation or an extreme hyper-focus, an out-of-balance dopamine that parents feel, family members feel. The identified patient is your trauma trigger, is your dopamine, and we need to detox you from that patient. It doesn't mean, what I tell people, it doesn't mean you're cutting them out of your life. That's not what I mean. It's like the silverback gorilla. The disease is like you coming in attached to the silverback gorilla. Family recovery is not about leaving and never seeing the gorilla again, but it's about cutting the rope. It doesn't mean you're not going to sit back and be scared of it or sit back and be frightened of it. It does mean you're not going to be drug around by it day in and day out, moment after moment. That dictates your life day in and day out constantly. And so learning how to navigate that 
and understand that your biology, like I said, when I said that if you ask 100 professionals, 100 professionals will tell you that family is the number one barrier toward treating somebody, and that's not intentional, and it's still the reality, is the understanding that that comes in our DNA. What's rooted in our DNA as mammals is to protect our offspring from pain and discomfort. What's rooted in our DNA is to protect... And so when they come home and say they're uncomfortable, big bad ward or big bad Blanchard isn't doing this or isn't doing that, or there's people doing this or there's people doing that, and we just want to come in and rescue them, come in and relieve the discomfort. And I get it. And that's exactly the symptom that we have to stop. It's not an indictment. It's not a judgment. It's just like a, a professional having a compassionate conversation that that's the symptom that we need to address. And that's just the reality of what happens. It's actually what makes family love and parental love so beautiful in 99% of circumstances. And in this one, it skews reality in this, this circumstance. Even in the healthcare field as professionals, they tell us you can be the greatest specialist, surgeon, doctor, therapist in whatever field, and you still can never treat family because you can never see them accurately. You know, I had a, uh, years ago, I had a, at the time, a five and seven-year-old niece and her mother struggle with substances. And my family was like, great, we have a, one of the country's interventionists in the family. And I'm like, bullshit, put her in jail. You think I think, you think I think rationally? When my five-year-old niece says, Tia Ward, come help me. You think I think like a professional or do you think all I wanna do is go run and scoop her up and protect her? And so I sat my rear end in a chair while another professional handled it. And now the mother's six or seven years sober and doing wonderfully. Because I didn't, I didn't know what to do as the professional, but I knew I needed to follow direction. And so emotional intensity skews objectivity. You cannot see family members accurately. And that's not an indictment. It's just a fact. Skews objectivity, especially an intense crisis that you've been a uh, 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 survivor of trauma. You know, your dopamine gets... Uh, uh, upset, just like the patient. The patient needs more of the substance, more of the substance, more of the substance to feel normal again. So do you. Your life gets progressively consumed by the identified patient. What they're doing, what they're doing. And how many of you guys, if you don't get a text back within five seconds, all of a sudden catastrophic thinking sets in and they're dead in the ditch somewhere. Just hypervigilant, hyperfocus. And you know, it's interesting that years ago, I I touted it was down in Texas Tech. They were one of the first one of the first of the years ago to start collegiate recovery. And I actually was a part of a group trying to raise money to study family members' brains. And they laughed at us at the time. And then these guys were the first ones to do it in 2019. And this was a study where in brain research, in the same way they identified patients' brain craves substances, family members crave them. So that's what a family member's brain looks like. You know, what you see here is this is a family member uh, members from the same family, somebody who followed the direction and somebody who didn't. You know, time doesn't heal all wounds. You actually have to do the work. Like just time alone, you can, especially with anxiety, you can work yourself up and create unhealthy thoughts and time does not heal all wounds. You have got to do the work. You've got to follow direction. And one, you can develop the resiliency and one, you can't. It's the frontal cortex developing again. Like I said, it's one family member that engaged with the services and one that didn't. I said, you've got to do the work. Time does not heal all wounds. But there's no time in the emotional world. If Erica came over here and punched me in the face and then I didn't see her for two years, what do you think I would think the first time I saw her? Yeah, go on. She hit me in the face. You've actually got to do the work around it to actually have to take the charge out of it. So you develop the resiliency. You can't just sit back and say time heals all wounds because you'll sit back and stir yourself up with unhealthy thoughts. Even like I said, the anticipation creates the dopamine trigger. And so family members, you got to follow direction too. You can't say, well, they're not following direction. They're not coming. And then when I ask you to come Thursday nights, say, I don't have time, that's incongruent. Why would you expect a, a patient to follow professional direction, but you're not willing to? It's what we call incongruent. Help me understand how you expect the patient to follow professional direction, but you're not willing to come to one hour a week on Thursdays. So it's our job, that's why I say the family system is, is our client, not the identified patient. The entire family system is what we have to treat in order to help. 
Because if you put these two right beside each other and if I took off the titles, you couldn't tell who was who. Would you trust either of those two? To, if I just showed you those images and said, which one of those two do you want making your medical treatment plan? You want, you want either of them. That's why the best prognosis, just like any other disease, is to find the professional. And I realize the little bit of hypocrisy of what I'm saying when I say 98% of professionals don't know what they're talking about. That's what complicates things. You actually got to find a vetted professional, vetted professional that knows what they're doing. Sadly, there are plenty of uh, people out there that take advantage of families in crisis, not a sense of urgency with a lot of money to spend to save their child or save their family. There are plenty of people that'll take advantage of that. That's why we give this workshop away from free to even to take that part out of it. And so it's also why we bring professionals in here saying these are vetted professionals. So you need to follow the professional's advice. And yes, 98% of the professionals don't know what they're doing, but there are some great ones that will do whatever it takes. And those are the ones that you need to follow because they don't teach this in school. I'm a marriage and family therapist. This isn't family therapy. This is not family therapy. They do not teach this. So not many people have this experience. And so family members, you know, this is the idea of like when you experience fulfillment in a normal, healthy brain, you have these dopamine thresholds. You go to, in a normal, healthy, stable brain, you go to Disneyland, you get healthy, job promotion, get healthy, kids do well in school, get healthy, come to Friday night, listen to Ward Lecture, get healthy, have fun. You know, but once you have dopamine surges, whether it's with substances or the trauma of identified patient, that threshold is raised and you don't have fun or don't have happiness anymore. It's called anhedonia, pleasure deafness. Family members, you guys feel that too. You guys have stopped engaging in your hobbies, your healthy habits, engaging in your healthy habits, and you have anhedonia, pleasure deafness too. Is it the result of PTSD? And make no mistake, when there's untreated mental health issues and untreated substance use disorders, there's no intimacy in the family or in relationships. And I'm not talking about physical intimacy, but the intimacy you see, emotional intimacy, cannot exist. When there's so much trauma and intensity, and if it's a and if the child's the identified patient, the parental splitting and the drama triangle that happens, there is no intimacy in the family. It's a result of PTSD. It's a result of trauma. It's not an indictment on the relationship with the family. It's a fact of what happens with PTSD. And so all of this healing is about all of that. That's why it's not just hyper-focused on the identified patient. That's why when the identified the young adults outside the parent's home it's because we're putting the, the very, we're, it's like asking a patient to go get sober in a bar. You know, it's putting the patient, the family member's dopamine trigger in the bedroom with them. It's very difficult for the family to heal. It's very difficult for the relationship to develop new patterns with that happening. No matter how healthy you are, it's a fact. And so as we end, well, what does this mean? What does all of this mean? You know, because how well does anybody change their behavior when you point to them and say, you need to do this, you need to do that. Not very well. And so, you know, we're not in control of anything beyond our nose and we're all surrounded by autonomous people that don't behave as we think they should. And so you're not gonna change anybody. We're not even in control of our own thoughts and emotions. If I say, don't think about an elephant. <laughs> how many of you guys thought about an elephant? We're not even in control of our own thoughts and emotions. And so you're not going to change other people. But what's the best way to get somebody to change? What's the best way to get somebody to bring down their walls? Bring down yours. Modeling the behavior that you want to be shown. Being the change agent. That's the best way to get other people to change their behavior. Same with leadership. When I do leadership consulting and somebody wants to complain about their boss or supervisor, and I say model the leadership you wish to be shown. That's how you change the behavior. You need to do that. You need to do this. You need to do that. It's not going to change things. It's not going to get you closer to your long-term goal. You know, but you becoming the change agent, you doing the behavior, that's how you get that change to happen. And it's hard to ask for change in others that you're not doing willing to do yourself. It's like I said, what we call identified patients, change agents. That's why when it comes to what you can do, that's why we say put down the microscope on others and pick up the mirror on yourself. Because if you got both sides of the equation, identified patients and family members, both without a frontal cortex reacting at each other, how well are their decisions? 
not very well. Just in intensity and chaos, solving the next immediate crisis, solving the next immediate crisis. And I completely understand that it's not your fault that it ended this way. Like I said, the healthcare system is not there to help you. It's thrown at your feet and everybody in this room did the absolute best they could with everything that was at their disposal. And now it's time to adjust. Now it's time for you to get the help that you deserve. And like I said, just like any disease, it's about following the professional's direction. And you do that, you begin to address the general family disease is what we're after. The general family disease is what this whole process is about treating. And so hopefully tonight's, uh, you know, material, you know, gave you guys some, some insight. Think back to that beginning slide when we're talking about empathy and perspective shift. And hopefully this information allows you guys to have a little bit of understanding with what the other side went through. Like I said, uh, patients, I was two years sober before I ever realized my parents suffered far more than I ever did. And so what they go through is tremendously painful. And patients and family members, I could tell you there's no life worth living, like waking up, living, feeling like you're, you can't live without the item that you hate. And feeling like you're in that prison, the toxic shame that, uh, you know, mental health and substance use disorders has. It's like jail. And it's nobody's fault, whether it's the, the disease your body developed or the trauma that you guys feel as a result. It's, like it's a healthcare crisis. It's nobody's fault. And it's your responsibility to do what you have to do to recover. But the beautiful part about that, if you do it, that's when post-traumatic growth happens. You know, the most beautiful, most amazing people are those that, you know, go through that and come out on the other side. Those are the people that we're attracted to the most, that develop that that resiliency. That's why the most accurate definition of wisdom is called experiential knowledge. And so hopefully this material, like I said, allows you guys to separate the disease from the person. It's okay to be angry and be angry at the disease, not the person, because that's what this is about is separating the disease from the person. And hopefully this little bit of information that gives you some accurate uh, information about the disease concept, both for the identified patient and the family is important in that process. So we can shift the perspective tomorrow of what do we need to do? Granted, we both of us aren't, you know, operating with a fully functional process. You know, how do we work together to become closer and more connected? And so I'm about 10 minutes over. So we're going to go ahead and end. Um, there is one thing I'd like to review with you guys before tomorrow real quick. Um, so we start at nine sharp tomorrow. Um, also, uh, there's one part that I ask, uh, really two parts, do not go home and try to solve all the family's problems. I promise you as much as you learned in the past two hours, you're not ready to start solving all the family's problems. Um, and also this, uh, this is everybody here, especially the, the identified patients. Please do not drink or consume any substances that aren't prescribed. And that does not, I'm not saying that anybody has a problem, but I'm saying you need to feel. I don't want you to anesthetize anything. We have a tendency to, to go have a glass of wine or go to just not feel. And I don't want that to happen. I want you to feel. And so please do not drink during this weekend. You're at a mental health and substance use disorder workshop. I don't think it's too much for you to ask <laughs> not to drink. And if you can't do that, then we need to have a different conversation. And um, so please do not, uh, go home and consume. Also, just out of respect for the identified patient, because when you also say not to do something, you also notice how prevalent it is. And all of a sudden you realize how incredibly difficult it is for identified patients to get sober when it's just everywhere. And so it just, it means that we're in this together, we're aligned. And so please don't go home and try to solve all the problems. Let the cable TV wash over you. Do not drink or consume uh, mind or mood altering substances, be here at nine o'clock. And my team has worked their tails off. Please go home. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get up out of here so they can go home. All right. Thank you guys.